Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this next panel, Reese Fade. Reese is a distinguished practitioner who has, um, whose career has touched all aspects of housing and community development, including neighborhood revitalization and affordable housing. Um, we're very fortunate to have her with us today. For the GSD community, um, who knows what a Loeb Fellowship is. Reese, like Tony and like um, one of our other panelists this afternoon, Emmy, they're all Loeb Fellows, so we're grateful that you come back to the GSD to share your, um, your expertise with us. So I'm gonna turn it over to Reese now. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So this is the point in the day which is the real challenge, right? We must all stay awake, alert, and look interested. Um, so, I'm, and this part of the program, we really are making a substantial gear shift. We really want to now look at some examples of, and people's actual work, and hear from people about things that are working, isn't, aren't working, and what their ideas may be on those subjects. So what we're going to do is each of our four panelists are going to come up, I'm not going to give you their, I mean, many choices. Um, uh, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to give you their, their bios, but each one will come up and take just 10 minutes to give you some background on what they're, the nature of the work that they've been doing and some of the ideas that they have that they can really share with you. So, with no further ado, we're going to start with Rodney Harrell, who's coming to us from AARP. Rodney, can you? And I can leave this here. I'm not sure if this is on either, but all right. So thank you very much. Uh, very excited to be here on uh, behalf of AARP. Uh, we got to hear a little bit uh, from uh, Lisa uh, earlier, who leads our foundation. And uh, I represent the part of AARP that looks at uh, policy solutions and uh, solutions for communities as they try to improve uh, themselves and, and meet the needs of people uh, of all ages. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit, spend my uh, 10 minutes on talking about uh, the concept of livable and age-friendly communities and tie them uh, to the concepts uh, that we're here today to talk about uh, in terms of uh, justice across uh, geographies. Uh, and uh, they're the, the foundation of a lot of the work that ARP does and uh, our livable communities work. Uh, the idea uh, is that uh, by the way, that ARP works uh, in across issue areas uh, to meet the needs of people uh, 50 plus, and uh, that's an important thing uh, that we need to do, especially as we heard earlier uh, that people are aging in this nation, and uh, that gives us really this imperative to look at the aging of the population, the fact that we're gonna have more people over uh, 65 than under 18 by 2035 uh, is a driving factor in uh, the kind of change that we wanna see in communities. Uh, it's an opportunity, it's like there's a gap there as we've heard all day uh, in the policy sense and in the programs and the activities that can help meet those needs and it provides us opportunity. Uh, I tweeted about this earlier that uh, I hope that all the, the students in the room are inspired by all the gaps that are here as that gives you an opportunity to start uh, looking at solutions. So what I wanted to start with though was a definition. <clears throat> so this is our definition of a livable community and ARP has been using this for over a decade. Uh, and the idea is that a livable community um, is safe and secure, has affordable, appropriate housing, transportation options, and services. And, and the idea is that all these things together can give people uh, the personal independence, allow them to age in place, and foster their engagement in the uh, civic, social, and economic life of their communities. So what's this, what this is saying is that uh, people, regardless of their age or their income or physical ability, should be able to find the options that they need and the services that support them to let them live their best lives in the community and be as engaged as they want to be. Uh, now, this is not a very uh, prescriptive definition. It's very outcome-based uh, that we uh, think these are the kinds of things that people would want to have in their communities to allow them to, to live those best lives. And it's founded... Uh, in uh, many different uh, things and an understanding of how we uh, understand communities and how people choose their neighborhoods. And uh, for those PhD candidates in here, you may one day uh, be forced to put your dissertation into a 15 word slide and uh, talk about it just like me. Uh, but the idea here is uh, that we all have our personal preferences. Uh, they vary depending on uh, many different factors, our age, our income, our physical ability, what have you, may factor into the types of things we want in a neighborhood. There may be some general things uh, there that uh, 
are good. People generally like parks or schools that are high quality. Uh, but there may be things that are uh, personal to you. It may be very important uh, for this gentleman to live in an urban area where he can walk the things. And uh, this young lady may decide to she loves rural areas and not to be any near, near any neighbors because uh, she can't stand people. Uh, <laughs> And so, you know, our, so that mix of preferences that we have differ between us. Uh, there's some general things. And also, as we got to earlier a little bit, that these preferences may change over time. That once we are no longer able to drive, having transportation options may be very important. Uh, but now we already have that home. Uh, as uh, Jen talked about, that we've had memories that we've been in for 20 years, we've raised our kids there, and so that home that we've had might all of a sudden uh, disable us and keep us in a place uh, that's not ideal. And so the idea of the policy work that we do is to try to address some of the limitations, the availability of the kinds of communities that are there that meet those needs, both in the short and long term, and uh, the uh, fact that many of those options might be there and aren't available. So as you have your preferences, you're limited today uh, by those things, and that, and that determines where you live, uh, but hopefully we can start to address those over time. So I'll talk about, uh, with that in mind, our age-friendly communities uh, network that um, ARP started this network several years ago, and as of last week, we now have uh, uh, 413 communities in the network, including five states, uh, both lists which include Boston and uh, the state of Massachusetts have joined that network. And the idea is that these communities have committed to over a long period of time, at least a five year cycle, to investigating uh, disparities and issues that may be in their communities that are impacting older adults, uh, developing a plan, implementing that plan, and then uh, going back uh, and, and reevaluating their success. And uh, they look at these eight, these eight areas uh, housing, transportation, outdoor spaces and buildings, et cetera. The idea here that's really important is that these are interconnected areas, that these are not separate things. So when you think about housing, we've talked a lot about housing today. Housing decisions are not separate from transportation uh, decisions, that where you live and how you're able to get around uh, may depend on either or both of those. Uh, and similarly through the rest of those. Uh, this foundation of this program is in the World Health Organization's uh, Age-Friendly Communities Program. Uh, ARP is a US affiliate of that program. And so this is actually a worldwide attempt to really meet the needs of an aging population uh, over time. Now, one of the big challenges a community might have when they enter such a program is not necessarily knowing, well, where to start from. You may survey your community members and hear what they have to say, especially if you're a small town, you may not have a planning department that has a lot of data on housing or transportation issues. Uh, so uh, my team and I developed uh, the world's first uh, nationwide neighborhood-based livability index. And if you want to make this interactive, you can go to the address there and look up your own neighborhood score. The idea is that we scored every neighborhood in the country uh, on measures of livability to understand what livability means to help you measure it. And also we talk about some of the policies uh, that can help you uh, achieve a more livable community. Uh, for this, we're limited by the things that we can measure nationally. So we organize things slightly differently uh, from those age-friendly community uh, domains. Uh, these are the measures that are within the index. And uh, again, you see some overlap there. The idea being that these things together, again, are the types of things that would make a community livable. So to save you some time, I looked up Boston. Uh, and you'll see here, uh, Boston, we looked at the city level. As I said, we can go down to the neighborhood. And one of the key things that's important about that is our ability to look at uh, across uh, different parts of a city. Uh, here you can see that Boston scores 63. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 100, it's just slightly into that green area, which means it's uh, doing better than most communities. Uh, that score is an average of all of the other scores you can see there on the side. Uh, you can't quite make it out on screen there. But one of these little gray things we have, uh, options we have, is an ability to look at things side by side. So I want to give you some examples of how we can use a tool like this and how we give it to communities to help them look at some of the uh, uh, differences within them. So when you look side by side, we, on this map, we have uh, a look at uh, Boston. And on the left, 
we have uh, the age of the population, I'm sorry, on the left we have transportation costs, and we have age groups on the right. And so you can see that uh, transportation costs are uh, much cheaper in the center of the map, in the center of town, and at the edges, where if you could tell, especially at the south side there uh, of the map, that where there are more concentrations of older adults, the darker color, uh, on the right, on the left, you see there's lots of transportation gaps and costs. They're uh, very expensive there. Uh, one of the things that's important to a lot of areas uh, is uh, the mobility. We talked about the Moving to Opportunity Project and the like. Um, and Raj Chetty here in the uh, economics department uh, had a concept uh, around this where uh, he, he and his team mapped uh, upward mobility. So while that doesn't take part of your livability score, we also track this. And this is a, a way to tell uh, how the chances that you might enter the top income strata after being in the lower income strata when born. And you can see how that differs across the area. And then again, compare that to say race on the, the right hand side as well. I'll skip this one again and go to another city example and show you Portland, Oregon. And here we're looking at uh, housing options. And on this map we have, uh, pardon me, we have the uh, housing options on the, the left, the percentage of, hand, of homes that are not a single family, uh, and again, the population 15 older on the right-hand side. And so again, you can see the mismatch of people and the kinds of options they may need if a single family home is too much or the upkeep is too much for them. Uh, so uh, getting back to that definition I mentioned, the idea for us is that we create these communities that have all of these factors that people need, and we know that communities aren't necessarily uh, structured in ways that serve people of all ages, and people of all uh, abilities, people of all races, creeds, and colors, that uh, we need ways to look at communities and help them understand these differences as a first step to addressing them. And I'll mention that uh, many of our communities have not necessarily uh, uh, have a, uh, a facility to do that, or, or the ability to do that very easily. And so providing tools that help communities start those kind of conversations, understand who might not be at the table or who should be at the table as you're starting the policy development process is very important and a way to create the livable, age-friendly communities that we need. So I look forward to our conversation, but that's a quick overview of what ARP is doing in the space. Thank you. Rodney's really given us a, a, a good sense of a tool that could be used as we start to have conversations across sectors and you have something that you can really start with as, a, as, an, as an opener for, for looking at things. Uh, we're now going to hear Emily Greenfield coming to us from Rutgers. Hi everybody. Uh, so. Okay, there we go. Uh, I prepared my remarks as a way of introduction to let you a little bit know about um, who I am and where I'm coming from in this great discussion of all these intersectional issues. Um, so my name is Emily Greenfield and I'm an associate professor of social work at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. And it's really a privilege to be able to contribute my voice here as part of today's discussion on opportunities for more deliberately integrating a socio-spatial justice lens within age-friendly initiatives, which Rodney just spoke about. Um, my work on age-friendly community initiatives officially began about five years ago. I first became interested in the age-friendly movement because of its emphasis on viewing opportunities around population aging not as a crisis or as a problem that needs to be solved or an issue that needs to be addressed, but rather the age-friendly movement's great recognition of the potential for good quality lives in their entirety, as well as a potential that is dependent in part on the decisions that local, regional, national, and even global stakeholders do or do not make. So I started my work in this area as an integrative scholar, building, um, helping to build a larger academic discourse on what age-friendly initiatives are um, when there's been very little um, research or scholarship on these very recently developed initiatives. But at the same time, I was in communication with stakeholders in my own geography, um, including two local private philanthropies that do grant making and aging. And through our conversations over the years, the philanthropies decided to launch an age-friendly initiative across their catchment areas in northern New Jersey. 
So I joined this group. Um, it's been my pleasure to serve as the developmental evaluator for their local age-friendly community initiative since 2016, while also continuing to advance pioneering research on age-friendly community initiatives for stakeholders near and far. Um, as far as I know, the work that I'm doing with these communities that we're doing in partnership is the only longitudinal multi-site study on the development of age-friendly community initiatives in the US at this time, which for people who are looking for areas of research where there's sorely needed to be more people and voices in this area, I think age-friendly community initiatives is a really good choice. Um, so to provide you with a better understanding of this regional project for the sake of our panel discussion, uh, the age-friendly community initiatives that I've been studying cover about a dozen municipalities that are generally considered to be uh, within the greater New York City metro area. The municipalities vary in size from 11,000 residents, that's the smallest, to about um, 125,000. But most of the communities that are doing this age-friendly work have about 30,000 residents in total. Um, some communities are very racially, ethnically diverse, and this reflects New Jersey, um, where there's a really great mix of people from lots of different racial backgrounds. And then there's other communities that are more homogenous um, with non-Hispanic white residents. Some of the communities are considered to be very wealthy with kind of hidden pockets of lower income residents, whereas others are considered to be more modest. So this project has yielded five waves of in-depth interview data with leaders of these local initiatives over three years. And really the primary scholarly aim of this work is to help to build the science of age-friendly community change. What makes communities work toward systems level change at the local level. So of course, um, activities that are part of age-friendly community initiatives are probably very familiar to the age-friendly leaders that are right here with us today. So events like having big community education events that are targeted toward older residents. Um, creating new communication products and platforms to better inform people of what resources for aging in place are already in their geography. Doing all sorts of assessments and including older residents in um, that work. And of course, lots and lots and lots of meetings. So it's one thing to be able to say, okay, these are all things that age-friendly community initiatives do, but the real question is, how do all these activities fit together in a deliberate and systematic way to drive forward um, age-friendly community change that's truly gonna benefit all? So I'm just gonna give you, um, Oh, but for the purpose of today's discussion on issues of socio-spatial justice, I just want to suggest that by better understanding age-friendly community change processes, we could actually help them to achieve their great aspiration to make communities better places to grow up and grow for all people. So I just want to give you one example of how developing the science of age-friendly community change can help us get at this really important challenge of recognizing not just long lives, but also unequal lives. So in collaboration with a PhD student at the Rutgers School of Social Work, Laura Ren Reyes, we are analyzing the interview data that we've collected over these past three years to develop a typology of older adults' involvement in age-friendly community initiatives. If you read the literature on age-friendly initiatives, there's this assumption or belief that older adults' involvement in age-friendly community change is critical, that these initiatives can't be successful unless older adults are involved. But we're not even sure, there's not even the research um, or the scholarly development or the theoretical frameworks to understand what is the phenomenon of older adults' involvement in age-friendly community initiatives. What exactly are we talking about when we, when we say that it's important for older adults to be involved? So we've done qualitative analysis of our interview data, and our findings are suggesting uh, a typology that includes five different categories of ways in which older adults are involved in these local change initiatives. So the first category, just to briefly summarize, is older adults as consumers. So when older adults attend a community um, education event or receive a resource guide that was created by an initiative, they are consuming information, goods, and services through the age-friendly community initiatives. Older adults as informants, the second category, involves older adults sharing their perspectives, their opinions, what the preferences are of um, aging in the community with the uh, age friendly community initiative leadership team. Volunteers are older adults who are really helping with specific tasks that need to be done as part of the initiative under the direction of the age friendly community initiative leadership team. 
champions are those older adults who are coming up with their own ideas and not just giving those ideas to the age-friendly leaders, but actually running with them and implementing action um, on their own initiative and with their own skills. And then finally, older adults as administrators are those who are actually part of the age-friendly community initiative leadership team who hold primary responsibility for driving the work of the initiative forward and kind of having this idea of ownership over the comprehensive goals and long-term sustainability of the work. So this is what qualitative research can help us learn. And then we come across, you know, um, an age-friendly exchange such as this, where we have um, an age-friendly program staff person providing a resource guide to an older adult. And so quiz time, what category of involvement would that older adult fall under, you think, most obviously, from what we know from the photo? Consumer, right? She's receiving information. So when we ask the question, are age-friendly community initiatives including older people from diverse backgrounds, from historically marginalized group, who are from, like in Tony Griffin's language, the less included, the historically less included. Uh, we can see that you know an initiative might be doing a pretty good job of including older adults from diverse backgrounds, maybe in one category of involvement, such as consumers, that they have a good mix of people coming to their events or taking their resource guides or um, getting assistance from the age-friendly leaders. But perhaps that doesn't necessarily mean that the older adults um, from historically less included backgrounds are being involved in some of these other categories. And we can talk about, is that a problem? Is that an opportunity? How can um, age-friendly leaders be more cognizant of these issues and strive to become um, ever more inclusive? And so this is just one example of how when we have a better um, framework for what age-friendly community change involves, um, we can be more mindful and cognizant of issues of diversity, equity, inclusion in the process, and I would hypothesize as well as in the outcomes of what these initiatives can achieve. So I'll just conclude by saying that I'm thankful to the organizations and individuals that make this research possible. I'm very grateful to you all for being here. I'm looking forward to the panel. And of course, thank you to the Joint Center, the Hastings Center, and the Charitable Trust for making today's convening possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. And uh, I think Emily's really helped us to begin to take apart the idea of trying to start some age-friendly initiatives and, and to think about them as something that has pieces which we can decide who we're going to approach, how we're going to try to execute. So thank you very much. Can we now have Robin? Thank you. She was already standing here. She got Robin Lipson from the state of Massachusetts. Hi, everyone. Am I using, I guess I'm using this mic. Um, full disclosure, if you haven't met me, this is not my real voice. I have laryngitis. I may lose it at any time. I want to call attention to the people I work with every day sitting over there who are going to come up here and take the microphone from me when I lose my voice. Um, we have a great team here. Antron was introduced. Emily Cooper, who's our chief housing officer and also an advisor to Mass Health on Housing. Uh, Amanda Bernardo, who's our chief of staff and has been leading our age-friendly work, and James Fuccioni, who runs the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it's great to see so many partners here um, from Massachusetts, but also to see the diversity um, in the room, and it's, it's given me a lot to think about. Um, so let me um, turn here for a second. Um, there's method to our madness here. Um, you heard about a city perspective from Emily, and I think she's given us a really good framework, which I was scribbling down madly. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of information from a state perspective. And I think the first thing I would say um, is that while there is age-friendly work going on in many, many states around the country, it is not always the case that state government is completely engaged. So that makes Massachusetts and New York and some others that Rodney pointed out pretty unique, but I think it's given us a much richer result, and I want to talk about some of the really great things that are happening because of that. Um, so um, 
This work has been going on in Massachusetts for at least a decade. Um, it started about 10 years ago um, when the Tufts Health Plan Foundation convened folks to look at creating a healthy aging data report, um, which is still being used today. That data report was developed way at the other end of Mass Ave, as far south as you can go on Mass Ave, um, at University of Massachusetts, Boston, at their gerontology center. Um, and that report takes data from multiple sources um, and then uh, arrays it by city, by town, in some cases by neighborhood, so that local municipalities can look at what is going on in their towns with regard to their older population. Um, you can look at where there's food insecurity, you can see where there's a disproportionate burden for diabetes, for heart disease, et cetera. So really important tool. That's kind of how a lot of this started. And cities and towns started to look at that data and to develop some plans around what they might do in their community. And they were assisted by AARP and by the Tufts Health Plan Foundation and a handful of other funders to start that work. So that was all great, right? All this work was happening. Um, but as we thought about it on a more systemic level, we realized about three, four years ago that we could be a bit more deliberate and we could focus a bit more on equity. Um, to make sure that this work was spread evenly across the state and touching many different kinds of communities. Um, and just about that time, Governor Baker had a big birthday. Um, he turned 60. Um, and it was at that point in time that we actually started to talk about what it meant to be an aging state. And so we're, we're very, very fortunate that he, he elevated the issue of aging. He included it in his yearly address to the Commonwealth. I think it's the first time that aging was mentioned in a state of the state address ever. Um, he created a, uh, uh, he signed an executive order. He created a council to actually look at aging in Massachusetts. And what's interesting about that council is it really wasn't supposed to be looking at all the stuff we were already doing, right? State agencies do various things. Councils on aging do various things. It, it, he, what, what he did is he appointed 24 people, some of whom were aging experts, some of whom were experts in transportation, housing, business, innovation, technology. And those are the people that came around the table to have this conversation. Um, and what we did is we spent a year traveling around the state and listening to people and asking them what worked about them aging in their community and what were the challenges. Um, and we heard some really interesting things. We heard that people really wanted to change the language about ages, aging. People were really experiencing ageism. People wanted to work. You know, 63-year-olds saying they didn't get jobs because their employer said, oh, I want someone who will stay with me for many years. Um, does anyone know what the average length of stay is for a millennial in a job? Yeah, it's like nine months, right? So, so the ageism that, that, that people experience is really palpable. We heard a lot about transportation, um, that people want to stay in their communities. They want to age in their community, but that means they need changes in transportation and in housing. We heard a lot about caregiving. Um, and really what we heard the most about was this concern about whether they would have enough money and whether they would have the resources to live in the community they want to live in. And so that's where we get to the issues around economic security and how housing is impacted. Um, so just to spend a minute on this, um, there's actually a way to measure economic security for older adults. Um, and again, this is done at UMass Boston. And the single largest driver of whether you have enough money to live is of course your cost of housing. Second largest driver is your cost of health care. Um, and what you can see in this, if you can read it, and we're happy to share these charts, share these charts is there's a pretty big uh, difference between men and women, and then between whites and other, um, other populations. Um, so we know right off the bat that there's uh, some disparities in economic security for older adults. And one thing that the Baker administration has done in the last year is while we haven't really figured out how to lower the cost of housing for people, he has in this past budget cycle made an investment to help people pay medi their medical bills. So if you are of a certain income, the state will now support you in paying your Medicare premiums. So for a 71-year-old who's paying $6,000 out of pocket right now for their Medicare Part B and their coinsurance and deductibles, that, that spend this year, if this person is eligible, goes from $6,000 a year to $6,000 
$2,600 a year, leaving about $5,400 back in people's pockets, which obviously helps them uh, become more economically secure. So that's kind of a really important tie to housing. Um, so as, as uh, we heard from AARP, some states have, um, have raised their hand and taken a pledge to become age friendly. Uh, we are one of them. We were the second in the state to do this. New York was the, f we were second in the country to do this. New York was the first. That really rubs me the wrong way. So we like to say we are second, but we're the best. Um, this was actually a recommendation from the governor's council that he appointed that we could actually make every city and town in Massachusetts age-friendly in some way or another. Um, the role that the state plays here is to really be an accountable partner in this work. We're not driving this work from the top down. We're not telling cities and towns what to do. We're trying to support cities and towns and to set a common set of themes and direction. And you'll see in the goals on the right, um, number one, deepen community initiatives. That really means that we want this work in all zip codes. Um, the third one, reframing aging. That's really about changing the language, not saying things like the silver tsunami or the demographic apocalypse. Um, and you'll see again, um, improving economic security. Um, this map is a little hard to read, um, but what it shows you is that of, of the 351 towns in Massachusetts, um, more than half of them are engaged in some sort of age or dementia-friendly work. Um, we haven't talked a lot about dementia-friendly today, but a critically important aspect to communities being capable for the people who are aging in, in their communities. And we are wildly agnostic about whether communities start with dementia-friendly work or age-friendly work. And we have actually created a toolkit so that communities can see how the two can coexist and work together. And I think that's part of why we've had such great take up, is that we're just meeting communities where they are. They can get technical assistance from the team I just introduced and others. Um, and we've really seen the numbers of communities increase. Um, one thing I want to point out to you, um, and James can raise his hand and you can go talk to him afterwards, is we took it upon ourselves to make sure that we were being really true to our goal that this work be inclusive um, and broad and reaching communities, even communities that didn't have the resources that others might. Um, and so we created an inclusive communities toolkit so that cities and towns can think about is their work inclusive? Is it touching the whole population? And when we were on the road for the first year with the Governor's Council, we had all kinds of people showing up at these public listening sessions. And I know that many people have challenges with hearing as they age. I know there are many people who are deaf and hard of hearing. It had never occurred to me until dozens of them walked into these sessions, that they felt left out of their community, that they weren't going to senior centers, they weren't engaged in programming at housing or where they lived. And that made me think, wow, inclusivity is a lot more than geography. It's a lot more than race. It's a lot more than economics. So that's part of what this toolkit helps us do. And finally, just some highlights, because we're supposed to be the happy speakers and tell you about some great things that are happening. Um, I'm thinking back about Emily's framework that she um, presented um, and her definition of champion. And part of our strategy has been to find champions outside of the aging silos, right? So we very aggressively work with housers, with transportation, with business, with community leaders. And I'll touch on these very, very quickly since my time is just about up. Um, Age-Friendly Berkshires, uh, this was one of the first groups. It was a region that came into the AARP Age-Friendly Network. They did it as a region. Um, as you know, it's rural, and the work they've done as a region is really exciting. Framingham and Lawrence are two examples of gateway communities where the um, health equity or health disparity group, however you want to call it in each community, teamed up with the Council on Aging to lead this work. They've had phenomenal results in Framingham, they have surveyed older residents in multiple languages, and, and they have a rich database now of what they can do. Um, City of Boston has done amazing work. Amazing work. They have a wonderful age-friendly plan. They've also taken on the issue of combating ageism. They have an ad campaign, which I encourage you all to look at, um, about aging strong in Boston, and they defy the normal stereotypes of aging. Um, have any of you been to the Topsfield Fair? 
So the Topsfield Fair is the first fair in the country to train dementia-friendly volunteers. So the Topsfield Fair, which I think just closed or is closing this weekend, um, is a dementia-friendly uh, county fair. Um, I talked about targeting investments to gateway communities, which is a big part of our funding strategy, both from philanthropy and from the state. And then finally, I just want to point out um, our most unusual suspect or most uh, creative champion has actually been the business community. Um, the business community has stepped up in Massachusetts and said, wow, we care about these issues. We have lots of people working for us who are caregiving for their partners, for older adults and their family. And for them, that's becoming a talent acquisition and management issue. So I kind of want to leave you with the thought that a lot of these solutions are in different domains than the ones you work with. And it's really, really important to be able to describe the challenges and the opportunities and to bring them on board. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And I, and I think that for me, the takeaway there is just how powerful and how much energy you can, you can really see flowing with your efforts when you get leadership buying into it. And when the, when the leadership, like the governor, is stepping up and inviting people to come, to come into the dialogue and to, and, to, and to be contributors. So thank you very much. We've now, got, we've now done national, we've done local, we've done state. Now Emmy's going to give us a little taste of what's happening around the world. Hello. Um, thank you so much for um, uh, inviting me for this important conversation. Um, so my name is Emi Kiyota. Um, I was a law fellow three years ago here in GSD. Um, and I just finished up a, a Global Brain Health Institute um, fellowship at UCSF and really studied about uh, dementia in a clinical setting so that I can bring that knowledge back into urban planning and architecture. Um, so today I would like to uh, focus on three topics um, to talk about. One is international perspective. And the second one is, of course, I just studied dementia. So I would like to bring attention about the dementia from you. And the third one is you know, aging in place and aging age-friendly community in the lower resource communities. Those are the three things I would like to talk about. So. Um, I'm from Japan, so we have a very high aging ratio, which is 26% these days, compared to US, which is 16%. Uh, it is quite high. Um, so we have, um, uh, we have a huge issue with um, both aging and the dementia friendly. So this is, this is a, a picture I took in Japan. Um, I wanted to give you a very realistic answer, uh, the viewpoint of uh, view about Japan, because a lot of people ask me, Japan, everybody look after their parents and older people really well. We try, but it is not always, actually. This is in the nursing home. Um, so one of the intervention I would like to um, introduce you is really based on a policy, which is we have a long-term care insurance. Um, so 90% of care is covered by the government. So middle-income people can age in place easily. Um, but our housing depreciate rather than appreciate, not like United States. Uh, people do stuck in their own public housing. Um, and then, if, you know, if your choice was to go to nursing home or stuck in your uh, public housing. But you know, all this care was delivered nowadays because we created the dichotomy of institution versus house. And the government tried to get back into community-based care. So we are using uh, community-based care to be able to care for, uh, care through adult day center, senior center, home care, visiting nurses. Um, but at the same time, people are still suffering from social isolation. So it is not only about delivering the services. So this is uh, one of the example from Osaka Prefecture. The, it is a cafe. Uh, it is right, it's, it's in the public housing. So they created this place where people can meet in a walking distance so that people can aging in place in the familiar community. Um, 
So aging in place doesn't mean that you can always age in place at your, your home. Sometimes you have to move to, like, you know, United States will be a CCRC. You know, people will say aging in place once you move in so that you don't have to move around and for different places, independent living, assisted living, and nursing home, and all this. So this is an example of Japan I wanted to show you. This is from nursing home. To the right one, um, from an architectural point of view, we don't have to design nursing homes look like nursing homes. You know, people can actually stay in a familiar environment in the familiar community. So when we think about compact city, just bring the services in so we're not going to create dichotomy of a bad institution versus home. That could be all integrated. Uh, I wanted to make the point for it because a lot of time institution and nursing home is outside of aging in place. But I think we really have to rethink that. We just integrate that into our aging in place strategies. On the, uh, on the right side, this person might be like quite bedridden person in the US, but this person is because this place is small enough that they have 10 people living in, in the living room space in the, in the middle of it. She actually stay in the living room space and it just, they cut the legs of um, the sofa. So if she fall, she doesn't get hurt. So people do provide services that she can actually spend the end, her end of life in this place so they don't have to move back to the hospital. So I was fortunate to be able to work with government of Singapore. Um, so I, um, I have been working with the Center for Livable City, which is Ministry of National Development, and Aging Planning Office, which is a multi-ministry organization. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a house in MOH, which is Ministry of Health. So Singapore is really quite progressive about aging in place. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the public housing situation, but uh, the Singapore uh, have 85% of people living in public housing. So what they do is to bring all the services into uh, the public housing that is existing, and this one is actually a newly built one. It, it, they have uh, community center, multi-generational center activities and senior centers so that people can age in the public housing. They also have an ease program, like 95% of uh, home modification materials are covered by the government in the public housing so that people can stay and age. Um, so I was fortunate enough to go around the world and being able to uh, engage in the aging and the aging in place. And I realized that, you know, what we try to do is to just try to provide other people a care rather than empowering other people to look after us. Um, I, there is a quote that I found in the Bhutan. It is, the time to be happy is now. The place to be happy is here. The way to be happy is to make other people happy. This quote resonated with me because it really captures the gap between what we provide for the elders and what they want. Everyone wants to be useful to others, uh, regardless of their age, physical, and cognitive capacities. However, current, our current system treats elders as people whom we have to look after, rather than treating them as a people who, ha who are resourceful to the community. I believe that we need to recognize elders as a variable asset and resources to their community, uh, empowering them to be a change agent themselves, uh, to challenge the prevalent nar uh, narrative of ageism and also the social role of elders. So this uh, picture, I, that's why I created the organization called Ibasho, that we work with um, older people and uh, directly in the community and organization to create the place where they can actually contribute back to the community. We create program and the place because the place is very important for people to create. So this is in Japan. We created uh, right after the tsunami happened. Um, so it really captures what we really wanted to do. The older people are exercising and kids are playing video games. But that's actually the reality of our current situation. So what we try to do through Ibasho is to really shift the leadership role 
into the elders and create the program that is multi-generational. And the type of activity is not the receiving kind of a care, but the elders can actually do something. Like in Japan, they created a cafe to serve children. And also, uh, they have ramen noodle shop. They have a uh, organic garden, and they have a garden stuff. And they have a bi-weekly um, farmer's market for the people who cannot really walk far to get materials. And uh, decision making should be done by elders. And community ownership is very important. And we uh, promote peer-to-peer -peer help. So we try to facilitate elders to help other elders. So what we try to do is to ins uh, create eight principles. So far, we created one uh, in Japan, and that was replicated thanks to our World Bank's uh, support to, uh, into uh, Nepal and Philippines. So the first principle is elders as a wisdom. So this is the elders in Japan. They are creating, talking about disaster relief and disaster prevention. You know, when the Japan earthquake happened, water, electricity was gone. Elders are the ones that knew how to cook with fire. Like, I don't know how to start fire. Um, <laughs> but those are the very important wisdom that we can actually carry out. And the next one, we create normalcy. We don't want a nursing home. We want a place where everybody wants to go. It really captures nice, again, children are playing video game. And older people are singing a song or just chatting. So it is not the place where everybody has to do the same thing together. Um, the third one is community ownership. This is a real picture. How, this is how elders actually decide what they want to do and how they want to design. And it's, everything has to be multi-generational. This is from Nepal, I think. And this is demarginalization. So we picked a space where this is a building that the Filipino elders actually created. We designed together. They are actually building day by day, slowly, by themselves. Uh, sometimes they hire people. But the, the person with the yellow shirt, um, he he has he's half blind, but you know he really wanted to try. He used to be a carpenter, so he helps. So when nothing is happening, he sits there and protects the building from vandalizing, like a kids vandalizing. But also, it's right next to the basketball court, so he is integrated. And it has to be culturally appropriate. We don't want to create Starbucks and McDonald's throughout the world. Um, and then resilience, uh, elders' activities, they actually, they, they have a more sustainable lifestyle than we do. So Filipino elders collect a plastic bottle and the Japanese elders and also the Nepali elders are creating the vegetable with organic. It's nothing, no chemicals. So the last one is embracing imperfection. We, if we try to strive too much on perfection, then we create another institution no one wants to go there because because it's rigid. So this is like, I think that um, health uh, has, and if some people who come into this place will be like, well, this isn't happening in the US because those people have like chairs <laughs> for the step. But you know, really just, they really make out of anything to create their own space. So this is a place in Japan, and this is in Philippines. This is Nepal. So these are all done by elders, and they are, they are making a building more dynamic than static. The day the place is open, it is not the last day of architect's job. That's the time where everybody starts to change. And we actually design and construct for 70% completion so that elders can finish. But thank you so much. Emmy, Emmy, I'm going to ask you, as well as the other, the other presenters, if you would join me on the stage, and we'll, we'll do some, some questions and answers. Okay. I'm not going. So ahead. sorry. No, I think I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're going to take the stairs for fall prevention purposes. Oh, right. there yeah, you exactly. go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to start off with a, with a couple of questions um, to to get the, to get it rolling. But then we really want you all to to join us and and to bring the uh, the conversation really 
down to earth in a way that, that we can all walk away with something we feel like, oh, that was a good idea, I'm gonna try that. Uh, and let me encourage you all to go to uh, hashtag aging in design. Uh, and we really wanna keep this dialogue going, so please. Um, uh, aging in a place. <laughs> Don't go to aging in design, go to aging in a place. You see what aging does to someone? I mean, really. Okay, so that, that all said. Um, great presentations and, and wonderful ideas. You've, you, as we've been talking about um, this aging, uh, aging friendly uh, movement, it really encourages, I think, the diverse stakeholders to be more intentional I hope, uh, more intentional in considering populations aging as, as really as part of their work. So you really are bringing that kind of intentionality to it. But if I could ask each of you to comment on, from your experience or from, or and from, what you just heard your colleagues describe, could you give us an example that you think is something that is facilitating that happening, that, that being intentional and bringing those, 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 that intersection to, to take place, and where do you think there's some impediments? What's really in the way of us leaving our silos? So I'll, I'll jump in first, if you can hear me. You can? Great. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's a few barriers, uh, particularly the barrier that most of us only know our own networks, our own neighborhoods. Mm. And so when we're having a community-based effort, like say an age-friendly community, uh, you may know that there's other folks on the other side of town. You may not know how to reach out to them. You may not know uh, what their conditions are even. Mm -hmm. So we try to tackle the conditions piece with tools mm. like our, our index, but it takes other efforts uh, to reach out and really get to know communities across town to make sure that you've got an effort that includes the, the entire wider community. And um, you know, in some cases, that's help when we have a, a government lead at the top to make sure that happens and spreads that out. But uh, you know, sometimes it does take the extra effort to have uh, and set up community meetings and surveys and other tools to try to get mm. people involved. So it's a big challenge uh, often that when we're having community leaders try to start an effort that uh, they may not know the whole community and they need to bring yeah. them in to be effective. And have you seen some places where it really has been particularly effective? Uh, I've I think the uh, effort in Washington, D.C. was great because I, I, they set up in community libraries across town. So uh -huh. there's libraries were evenly spread out. So let's have a focus group in the library, make sure that every neighborhood now could come mm. to the library and enter into uh, their comments into our plan, uh, as well as sending uh, surveys out uh, as well. And uh, I see there's a range of communities, and I'll, I'll uh, say New York on this one, uh, where uh, they brought in the leadership at a very high level and said, we've got to look at all parts of the community, all departments in the city, and we've got to figure mm -hmm. out how, how that comes together. So uh, different models that, that have worked. Great, thank you. Emily? Sure. Um, is this on? Yeah, okay, great. Um, I think for me, what's so exciting about the age-friendly global movement, and as we experience it here in the United States, is that it's trying to do exactly what Reese just described. It's trying to make aging, which is so obvious, right? Like we're all aging, it's part of, it's a fundamental part of being human. And yet it's something that um, we live in a society that wants to, you know, fight against aging or deny it or doesn't want to talk about it for, for a whole host of, I think, um, social, historical, possibly biological reasons why, why we have a society like that. And so here we have a movement that's like explicitly trying to change that from the bottom up and the top down at the same time. I think what we quickly realize in doing this work is that age is always at the intersection of other social positions. It's never age alone that defines what someone's day-to-day -day or quality of life is. It's, it's always age um, across the whole host of other kind of social positions that someone um, might occupy. And so this idea of intersectionality in aging is, um, I think, the, the, it's, it's practical and theoretically, theoretically correct way to think about um, aging, and yet it's so hard to get um, people to understand aging and all of its complexities just thinking about age alone and diversity in aging experiences, and that age isn't just, you know, decline, that there's other dimensions 
of aging and that our communities matter, the environmental context matter, the policies all matter. And so when you try to have a conversation of aging at the intersection of all these other things, it's almost, um, it's, it's, I think it's really challenging. And I think the age-friendly movement struggles with wanting to be this for all social movements so that it doesn't just become about those older adults who, you know, there's pretty good research to show the older adults are always thought of as someone who's 10 years older than you are. Like, no one um, <laughs> leads with their age identity, necessarily. And um, so, all right. Well, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna, Emily, could you give us maybe from one of those communities that you're working in now, what that, what that intersectionality actually looks like. I mean, what are the what are those pieces that are stacking on top of one another and creating the particularly uh, troubling circumstance? So I think this is one of the reasons why it's so important to look at age-friendly community initiatives over time, because I think in the beginning, um, in the communities that I study, they just have to start with talking about age, but I think as they're maturing in their implementation um, over the years, now they're starting to get more uh, depth around age at the intersection of other things. And um, I think once the leaders of these initiatives kind of are able to layer on top of the age-friendly lens, uh, a uh, diversity, exclusion, and equity lens mm -hmm. as well, then they're starting to realize um, the importance of uh, reaching out to other stakeholder groups. So, for example, um, you know, comparing communities in the networks that I study, if a community has a nonprofit organization that's already well connected to um, marginalized groups or that has faith-based leaders that have those natural networks and is engaging in the age-friendly coalition mm -hmm. or the steering committee, that's a much easier context and you can achieve, um, mm -hmm. I think, more around issues of equi equity more quickly than in communities that lack that kind of infrastructure. It takes more time for them Good. to okay. have to build it as part of the age-friendly work. Great. Robin? So I think the single most important thing, uh, the single uh, most intentional thing we can do to support this work is to create the space to have the conversation. So whether it's in cities and towns where you give them a little support to hire a project leader so that they can get the data, convene the people, facilitate the conversation. We've seen that often as a very important starting point to getting the right people around the table. Or whether it's, um, I'll, I'll go back to the business community again. Uh, Amanda helped facilitate a meeting um, several months back with the Massachusetts Business Roundtable. And it was a meeting about caregiving. I mean, this is the, the, the business group in Massachusetts that represents the largest employers in Massachusetts. They care about taxes, education, transportation, infrastructure. They had a meeting to talk about caregiving. And, and just the, the idea of having all those leaders around the table with the space to talk about that issue. You know, we had the regional leader of, of Cigna and others just talking about how personal this was for them. They had never had an opportunity to talk about this before and to connect their own experience to running their businesses. So I think just creating a place to have a conversation and setting the table is a, is a very intentional thing we can all do um, in all the domains to advance this conversation. Thank you, thank you. Emmy? Yes, um, I'm gonna stick with what I know from my uh, projects. Um, I think what I've, uh, encounter the most difficult, the challenging thing is older people are the most ageist, actually. They feel, <laughs> they feel like, oh, the people with dementia, those people are different from me. They are older, mm. all, those are people are different from me. And also, I'm 75 old, years old, I can't start organization. You know, just like a lot of mm -hmm. preconceived notions that kind of limit people's thinking that I found that it was, it has been a big barrier. Um, to tackle that, um, I'm, no, I'm not 75 years old yet, so <laughs> I always tell them that, you know, I'm going to have to be very honest. You know, if you would like me to respect you because you want the respect from the society, you also take that, you know, initiative to show me why you have to be respected and how you want you know, how you want to be helpful for the young generation. So it's not going to be one way or another. So those uh, realistic conversations, I feel like it's lacking because a lot of time, just like people coming into town hall meeting, they just tell them what they want to hear, but it just doesn't move the needle. So I feel like, you know, 
practical, very realistic conversation among gen great. generation should happen. Great, thank you. Um, because I'm fundamentally a housing person, um, I, I, I want to go back to the to the to the built environment, to the to 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 the, the spatial part of this conversation. Um, I recall that when I was uh, I had been working for more time than I'd like to remember at building and designing um, uh, affordable housing developments, and uh, one of my colleagues um, challenged us. That as for all the work that we'd done in terms of making them wonderful spaces and the apartments were terrific and there was great access to get in and out and all the program, all those things that we had done, um, and that we were very concerned about them being economically as well as, as um, racially and, and ethnically mixed. Um, he turned to me and said, but you realize there are no spaces for those people to pass each other or socialize. And that there was no there was no way for people to kind of execute what we thought we were creating as a as a community. I wonder if each of you could speak to what you think would be some ways that would be from your from your experiences some some really good ways of having the spaces or point to us the spaces which are getting in the way. Of, of our of our success. I mean, what what is the unfriendly, if you will, the uh, the unfriendly spaces and the challenges that 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 are there that you think are not being addressed terribly well. We could start. We'll start again with you. Ro. Sure. Uh, and so <coughs> the first thing I think about is, uh, you know, the combination of kind of the interior question, part of this question and the exterior. So okay. the location of a building within a community, is it near the kinds of things that people need? Is it near transportation so that uh, either the older adult themselves can get around or their family members can mm -hmm. come to visit? Uh, those locations matter a lot. Uh, and uh, and I th th immediately came to mind and started writing down this anecdote about a place I visited, a affordable housing building in um, uh, Cleveland. And it was a great building. Uh, in this case, it was designed and people were doing a great job interacting. And then uh, I wondered why they weren't taking advantage of uh, the transit access. And mm -hmm. then I realized there was a rusty staircase that they couldn't go down on one side. And on the other side of the neighborhood, uh, they were too scared to go over because there was crime there and the, all the street lights were out. And the idea that we have to think about the context of these things, mm. I think really matters. Uh, moving to the interior, it's the idea that uh, there are many things we have to do at one time. And so uh, we have to design, you know, designing for efficiency in many cases, we're designing uh, for people with different needs, uh, but it's the conscious effort to try to address the range of needs that the type of people that are in any particular space need at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes uh, incumbent upon us to take those into account with, with design. And so the idea that uh, if we're focused on uh, creating a social environment where uh, people can interact, is there you know, a community room or space where people might want to interact? Uh, in some cases, it might be a TV room. In some places, it might be a joint kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, in some places, it might be an uh, outdoor garden space. But you know, thinking about these kinds of elements and thinking about the particular population, uh, and by the way, those things will differ in different cities with different populations, with different yeah. Uh, yeah. types of people. You have to kind of take that into account as, as you're doing this, and that takes understanding uh, the, the goals of the, the residents of these places. And who should be championing that work? I mean, it, the short answer is all of us. I, and it, I mean, it's, it takes effort, and, and it's, uh, we brought up kind of the uh, discriminatory attitudes towards aging, even amongst the older population. Uh, you know, uh, there's a movement around disrupt aging and the idea that we shouldn't think about um, aging as something that disables us, but think about uh, you know, all of the, the um, uh, conditions and individual uh, abilities and, and things that come with it. Uh, that's kind of a, a national conversation. There's the mm -hmm. work of the folks that are building these spaces. There's government agencies that are uh, helping to frame the policy environment in mm -hmm. which these things are built and give incentives for different things or, or the like. I mean, it, it's hard for me to pick one, frankly. It's, okay. it's, this is an all hands on deck issue. It's yeah. really not uh, simple. Uh, as someone once said, all the easy problems have been solved already, so we're stuck with the hard <laughs> ones. And, and we need but to work aging. together to try to address aging and, and these, these kinds of questions. It's not just a, a easy fix, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you. Emily, you have some sure. thoughts on this? 
Yeah, so I think um, in its early phases of development, the age-friendly movement has been heavily emphasizing the outcome piece of age-friendly, like what does an age-friendly community look like or what does an age-friendly building look like? Okay. And through the research that I've been doing and um, reading a lot of, uh, you know, articles and the ideas from outside of the field of aging, really come to appreciate that um, the, the, the secret sauce of the success of Age Friendly is actually in the collaborative processes that go toward mm -hmm. creating that outcome, um, regardless of what that outcome necessarily ends up looking like or being exactly. And so when you are, you know, creating a building or creating a resource directory, like whatever level of output that is from the Age Friendly Community Initiative, the really interesting piece is what organizations or individuals were drawn into this work that realigned their resources or grew in their approach to thinking about a particular problem that wasn't there before by accomplishing that project. And I think um, when it comes to the built environment side, uh, really drawing on some of the cutting edge ideas uh, within, the, within planning, with mm -hmm. like participatory planning and rethinking um, different strategies to involve the public in this decision making process in a more authentic um, and meaningful way. And I actually think Tony Griffin's work um, is in the camp of that kind of avant-garde, cutting edge, new way of thinking about um, different ways in which different community stakeholder groups and individuals and organizations may be included or excluded mm -hmm. from that process. And if you can get the collaborative process optimal, I think you're more likely to get the outcome that is going to be more equitable and inclusive. A, a terrific point in terms of the collaboration, and you're right, it goes back to Tony saying she wouldn't go to a community to have this, to start those conversations if it wasn't a real cross-section of all the sectors. That's terrific. So kind of going back to your built environment question, yes, I thanks. think people can live in beautiful apartments and be terribly isolated. You know, you might have the nicest dishwasher in the world and a great view, <laughs> but you might be, you might never leave your apartment. So I think what we have to couple with the right kind of built environment are the right kinds of services. And we have, a, we have some great models here in Massachusetts. In fact, Kim Brooks, who is like my guru on this, is here. Um, at Hebrew Senior Life, they do just that in their housing. So this idea of having some site-based services or staff who can facilitate some engagement among residents, um, who can think through, well, if the mailboxes are over here and you have to go through the coffee mm -hmm. area to get your mail, you might stop and have a cup of coffee. You know, somebody who can think about, well, we haven't seen Mrs. Jones in three days. Um, you know, someone who can facilitate a game of Scrabble, Mahjong, Bingo, whatever. I mean, I, I think some of this is about making a very modest, small investment in services at the site. So mm -hmm. to, to really just facilitate the community the using those. all the resources. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, I, think, um, I think it depends on like new construction versus renovation. I think um, if just try to rethink about what housing means for older people, I think like accessibility might not be enough. I like to be able to see like adaptability going into so you don't, you have um, so people don't have to adjust their home, but a home will be able to adjust your needs because not everybody develops the same you know, disabilities or symptoms. So how can we actually rethink about uh, creating environment that can be most adaptable so that people can just change and switch around uh, to adjust their needs? And the other thing is, um, um, I think the renovation piece of it is just basic accessibility. I feel like it's lacking everywhere, especially in the public housing sectors. So like basic accessibility is a must, I feel like, before we do anything. And the last one is a social space we talked about. Like we, I think having a social space is very important because you know we try to create a home, but if you don't have a destination to go to, the home become prison because you don't go out. Yeah. So destination is important, but the destination, the social space, who has the key, who has the um, sort of sense of ownership really changes it. Uh, I think Ibasho, when we created, it was so important that elders in the community owns key rather than community center or like a government mm -hmm. has it because once the government has the key, 
people don't socialize that much because it become another institution. So you creating oh, a social space in affordable housing community yeah. is really a great thing, but who owns the key, you know, just how are we gonna make that space walkable is something that we have to think that, about. That, that's terrific. I was really struck in, in your, your slides by the number of uh, examples that you showed that I would call very informal ways of of, of handling issues and, and of, and of treating, treating um, an aging population as sort of part of the whole. Um, is that something that um, was just your, your looking at what was going on, or does there, are, is there this, a similar conversation going on in some of, in some of those places? Um, I think I've learned based on what, what happening, and I think, uh, this is my biggest learning. I think I over, uh, underestimated what older people could do when I started, I have to say. Um, but if I go with uh, more flexible ideas, they actually have a better idea each time. So we, <laughs> but you know, I think I just needed to trust, to develop the trust between them. Yeah. Um, but once you have that, older people to me was much more creative than what we could think we could do. <laughs> Speaking on behalf of older people, I want to thank you. Um, <laughs> let, let's, let's see what, what, our, what our audience and our, and our fellow um, uh, folks have out here to, <coughs> to ask us. Uh, yep, gonna, uh, there's someone coming around with, with, with mics. And would you mind saying where, where you're coming from? Sort of, you know, what your background is, why this was the way you wanted to spend your day? Oh, well, that gives away too much. Mm -hmm. uh, I lead the Dementia Friendly Initiative for the city of Boston. And so I was so thankful, Robin, for mentioning the integration of age and dementia friendly. That's always exciting to hear. So thank you for that. And Emmy, um, I just wanted to ask you in your work, what were the biggest challenges to creating dementia friendly social spaces and making that mm. intergenerational connection? That's great. Uh, intergenerational connection is rather easier compared to d dementia. I have a feeling you probably have a similar issues uh, because older people themselves are so worried about them getting a dementia. So just try to differentiate them as themselves, you know, for them. Um, but it took the Ibasho in Japan, it's been operation for seven years now. So it took about three, four years in. Finally, we are able to talk about how can we integrate your neighbors with dementia. Um, so they, they actually do try to integrate and they knock on the door of the person who is living by themselves, uh, that including dementia. But one quite striking story that I heard, so older people told me that the city came with money to say, can you make memory cafe on Friday night at seven o'clock? And the elders said, we won't do that because elders with dementia are always welcome. We don't want to create the special time for them to come because that creates more stigma. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, it just spoke to me quite well, you know, because I think that's what they're afraid of if when they get there. So, but how we can just make dementia friendly, I, I honestly feel like we, our timeline is normally shorter than what older people will have the tem their timeline to change the community, so that adjustment needs to be done, but I don't really have a clear answer for that. We're still working on it. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. Ah, there's a gentleman back there. Hi, I'm from the Kennedy School. I'm also local. I live in the town of Natick. Um, <laughs> I'm active with the Affordable <laughs> Housing Trust Fund there. Um, I mean, most of you in this room are probably familiar with this appalling statistics. The uh, median net worth of a uh, non-immigrant black family in greater Boston area is like $8 versus quarter million dollars for a white family. So in Natick, um, the demographics is like close to 88, 89 percent white. And when I go and present in the town meeting space, which is kind of probably 95 percent kind of homogenous, uh, it's it's impossible to like advocate for higher densities, and most of the opposition actually come from those whose median age is like 55, 60, mm -hmm. and no one talks mm. about race, no one talks about class, let alone inequality. I mean, how are we going to like you know change these dynamics? Because it's really impossible to get anything done um, outside of Cambridge and Boston. 
that's that's uh, great. I, I'm going to ask. <laughs> I'm going to take this one on. Oh sure, why not? Yeah. Well, <laughs> because you have an index. You have an index. <laughs> well, it's it's a it's this is actually gets at a deeper issue, and it's it's in part the. Uh, the complexity of the issues we're talking about uh, can be lost, uh, and it, it. And the other piece to me is the uh, the concerns that people have don't necessarily take into account uh, long-term needs, and that's part of the conversation we're trying to have, right? That the person that's opposing you at that town meeting might uh, need that same option. 10 years later when she has a fall and now she's got to move out of the neighborhood, perhaps even into a nursing home because there's nowhere without steps because they didn't build that building. Um, and that person doesn't realize or understand that at the time. And I think that's a big part of that education gap uh, that I hope that we and other organizations can start to fill uh, to really uh, start a national conversation and help uh, people to do that uh, and understand that better. And that's why we create tools like the, the ones that we do to try to give a basis for people to understand those broader pictures. I think in the, the short term, in those uh, community conversations, there are two types of people, I think, to deal with that, are, that, are, that you're describing, one of which is the ones are the ones that don't necessarily uh, quite get the gaps you're talking about or, or the needs there. That becomes a simple education, a uh, relatively simple education piece. Mm. Uh, but then there are others who uh, are using coded words, who are using uh, uh, you know, policies and procedures to try to keep those people out, whoever those people are. And um, in, in that case, it's, you know, it, it's much tougher to pull that out of people, uh, but uh, we need to confront those attitudes. We need to actually uh, call them out for what they are mm -hmm. and uh, recognize that uh, if we're going to have a community conversation about making sure our housing needs are met for all people in our community, we need to to meet those needs too. So, you know, that's a hard conversation to bring. There's no magic key to, to make mm -hmm. it happen, uh, but it is something that, that needs to, and, and frankly, uh, allies, uh, to our point about even what makes a great age-friendly community effort uh, go, uh, allies in that conversation often help to try to get that uh, elevated to where it needs to be. Yeah, Emily? I can reflect on this a little bit from the local age-friendly perspective. So one of the wonderful things I think about the age-friendly change model is that um, it has multiple domains. So of course housing is part of it, but it also addresses transportation and social participation and issues of respect and inclusion. And so I found in my study of the local initiatives over the years, housing is seen as among the most important pressing issues that truly matter to residents in the community, and yet it is seen as the one that is the most out of their control and the one that they feel like if we start going in that direction, we're just going to be sinking mm. in a lot of time and energy and not getting anywhere, and it's going to hamper our efforts kind of overall. And so what they've um, kind of, through design, maybe not by plan, is they move more slowly in the housing issue while they're gaining traction in other domains. And through mm. their successes in other domains, like let's say um, even in the, in the realm of housing, they have a big housing summit that is um, targeted toward middle-aged and older adults in the communities around what are some of the available services for home repairs, what are some um, nonprofits who are providing in-home supports, how can you do a reverse mortgage to address affordability issues? And then they see that, oh, a lot of people came to the housing summit. Like, we've never done a housing summit in our community, and people are showing up, people are interested, and they want to talk about this. Oh, let's get the sign-in sheet. Maybe we can ask people, like, are you interested in coming to a task force meeting about housing in our community? And so slowly they build these collaborative relationships. They get new people kind of engaged in the conversation through the age-friendly lens and not necessarily through the affordable housing lens that maybe, maybe over time um, it will lead to something. And I think it's really tempting mm -hmm. um, with any of these really tough structural like issues that are the hard problems that are here, that have been around for a long time and we're dealing with them. It's easy to get trapped into the like, if only we had a city council that was more progressive and understood what the needs are, or if only the state policy changed so our local community, like, I think the spirit of age-friendly community change is we don't live in if-only land. Like, we got to do, and we learn through doing, and, you know, we, we're planning and we're using data, but we're also trying, and kind of this design-based thinking of, like, let's do and evaluate in the very short time, pivot, make sure we're kind of in the general direction, and keep progress That's moving good. forward and build, as opposed to just waiting for some external thing to change, and then all our problems will be solved. So when you're having a bad day, you know who you should call to get kind of a little <laughs> cheering on. Is there another hand? Some, uh, 
back, all the way in the back. Let's get someone who's sitting in the, in the uh, cheap seats. I was going to say bleachers, but that really isn't the right <laughs> phrase. We're in Piper, after all, right? I really appreciate all the speakers today, and um, what I'm hearing a lot of is how do we retrofit a system that's really not working? How do we retrofit? the political aspects of it, the structural aspects, and the medical aspects of it. Uh, decades ago, I lived in Norway, and I've traveled throughout Scandinavia, and f there, for years and years, houses have been built with doorways that you can get a wheelchair through. All houses, young people buy these houses. And it seems to me that if we don't start looking at architecture, what we're going to be doing is continually trying to stick chewing gum in a sinking ship. And so I'm wondering, you know, who here is involved in the architecture community that's looking at how do we build houses where all people can live? Then we take away the stigma to start out with because it doesn't look like an old person's home. It looks like an everyone's home. And I don't know about you, but I bet, well, I, just speaking for myself, uh, I was in my early 30s, I think, when I fractured my collarbone. Not just broke it, it was like in pieces. Um, I was disabled for a while. I broke my foot a few years ago. You know, stuff happens. A 12-year-old can break his leg skiing and then all of a sudden, accessibility getting in and out of the bathtub is an issue. You know, um, all of the showers are accessible, you could w roll a wheelchair in. That stuff could be built from the beginning so that it's not. Um... Yeah, that's that's helpful. I mean, just quickly, I think there's no reason why every home in this country isn't built with uh, the principles of universal design or human-centered design or, or these other design languages that do exactly what you're talking about. Uh, that we should um, encourage them. Uh, we should be thinking about people of all abilities using uh, homes and other structures, uh, and you know. There's certain places that have taken policies in place, visitability policies have been passed in a lot of places, uh, which makes you uh, have the entrance and the wide doorway so that people could visit your home. Uh, that comes from a civil rights basis that those people with disabilities have the right to visit you. Uh, but it hasn't been accepted as mainstream, the concepts uh, that we should be designing for all with these. And you know that's the, really the way to make the change, not that, uh, you know, that we should have the add-on pieces that look like they're for people with disabilities, but that we've just done these yeah. things in these environments. Yeah. Uh, now, that the uh, positive piece to me is that we've got things like uh, open floor plans are popular, and that helps, you know, that uh, incidentally is something that helps with uh, you people navigate homes, uh, but we've got to do something about it. Uh, but I will challenge you on this piece, though, which is while we should think about the future, we also have over 100 million uh, homes already existing in the country, and there's a lot of people living in those homes and that will live in them too. So, uh, you know, it's great, and I, I love to think about th us doing things differently in the future, but we also have to think about how we can modify and adapt what we have. Robin, are there some initiatives that have, uh, that, that sort of speak to some of this that has come out of the work that you've been doing in the state? Um, I mean, a couple of things. You know, we looked at, and, and in fact, we have just included, the state housing uh, agency has just included some universal design standards in their, I don't know what the word is, Emily, in their upcoming uh, request for Qualified yeah, QAP, plan. there you yeah. go. If you know what a QAP is, that's what it is. Um, we also, um, you know, have conversations about, um, uh, 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 there's a program that helps renovate existing homes, to Rodney's point, to become more accessible for people who might have mobility challenges. Um, we look a lot at, uh, you know, community spaces. I think a lot of the, um, senior centers that have undergone renovations of late have really thought through how can these spaces be more leverageable. Um, so for instance, in the Merrimack Valley uh, a year ago during the gas explosions, that Lawrence Senior Center became a place where many people were taking showers every day, people who didn't have power in their homes. And so thinking about you know built environment and community resources is definitely part of the conversation. That's, that's yeah. great. And it sounds yeah. like taking advantage of an opportunity to, to get into the conversation and to be able right. to put, put that forward. Um, let, I can take one more question. Can I do one over here? Yes. No? Oh, yeah, no. Yep, yep, you. That's right. <laughs> 
I'm privileged to serve on the planning board in my suburban Boston town, and um, so I come at this from a lens of the built environment very much. And one of the things that we find very problematic is at the state level, um, the we are restricted from making certain types of zoning bylaws that would restrict for instance, house size. Currently, the market forces and it and zoning and building code all seem to sort of cater to market forces or allow the market forces to go wherever they want to go. And right now, if you live in one of the wealthy Boston suburbs that has good schools, the market is such that modest houses get torn down. We're above the five hundred thousand dollar level for teardowns at this point, and McMansions get built. I think yes, we should have universal design standards built into the building code, mm -hmm. but I don't think saying architects or builders should do that is enough because we've seen decades of evidence that they won't do that. They value engineer. I think that we need to get out of whatever silos we're in and get behind zoning change at the state level and building code change to make it more realistic that some of these things get realistically passed. Well, thank you very much. That's the, a, a, really good, a really good closing comment for us. Uh, and as, as, we're, as we're breaking up, um, let me just thank everyone and thank all of you for, for your very thoughtful presentations. And I think the piece that has most come out of this, in, at least as, as I've been listening, is really, I think, going back to your phrase about collaboration. And it, goes, it takes us back to, to Tony's, uh, uh, well, her statements about, about collaboration. Um, it is very hard to do. And it does take, as, as I think Rodney tried to point out to us, looking beyond your sort of normal comfort levels. I don't know anyone over there. I don't know anyone over there. Or on the other side of town or, or in another discipline. But intentionality, if that's really what we're going to say is the critical element here, intentionality takes work. And it takes a lot of work and it means also reaching beyond not just things that you aren't familiar with, but things that make you uncomfortable. And I think you all have an, a devotion to a body of work and to a quality of life that you can use as a source of energy at really reaching out to peoples and to situations that are past your personal comfort level. But using this element of, of, of work, using this work around, around aging population, since aging is an inevitability, um, is a way in which we can do a, a better job at that. I look at this audience, we're grateful that you're here, but you ain't terribly diverse. Um, so we've got to be deliberate in the work, and I think with that deliberateness, we can do anything. Thank you very much. Thank you.